A lot of the time, a lot of people get stranded into the wilderness. It could be in national parks, national forests, or just anywhere, even a park or in your own backyard. There's a lot of cases where people go missing or get stranded and they don't have the clothes or the food or the resources they need to survive. We're going to be reacting to a video where a person gets stranded into Alaska. This is the infamous death of Carl McGunn. When the ashes cool, I'll be cooling along with them. I chickened out once already, but I don't want to go through the chills again. They say it doesn't hurt. That's a quote. What does that mean? Carl McCunn was an American wildlife photographer who set out on a solo journey to the remote wilderness of Alaska in 1981, hoping to capture breathtaking That's photographs of the wildlife and Alaska is definitely a beautiful place. He planned to spend several months living in a tent, away from the noise and distractions of civilization. McCunn classed himself as a skilled outdoorsman who had experience in wilderness survival, and he was confident right. that he could handle anything that nature threw his way. However, McCunn's journey ended in tragedy months later when he that, became like stranded and forgotten about. Get forgotten. Now, McCunn is remembered, but not for his photography or his daring expeditions, but due to becoming the subject of one of the most mm. infamous wilderness survival stories of all time. This is the tragic story of Carl McCunn. Carl was born to parents Donovan McCunn and Erica Hess in Munich, Germany on the 25th of January 1947. Although born in Germany due to his father who so was this in the is United States too, Army being stationed there, he was, he was raised and grew up in San Antonio, Texas. Unfortunately, not much at all is known about McCunn's childhood, but by the time he graduated from high school in 1964, he was described as being 6 feet 2, weighing 240 pounds, he had curly hair and a warm, friendly personality. McCunn briefly worked in the United States Army before being discharged in 1969. He then moved to Seattle before moving to Anchorage, Anchorage Alaska, Alaska in 1970. But, Something wow, had always drawn McCunn to Alaska, and there are various reasons for this. This the Alaska right? in the, the early 1970s incredible was still a rugged and untamed picture. wilderness, with vast stretches of I mean, unspoiled forests, beautiful. mountains, and rivers. It was a place where the beauty and the harshness of nature intertwined, and where survival skills were essential for anyone who ventured into its remote regions, and to be honest, it still is today. Of As course. a Brit, I have always <laughs> dreamed of going to Alaska. There is just something incredible about how unspoiled it is and continues to be. However, compared to now, Alaska was much less developed back in the yeah, day. It's definitely with true. Fewer roads, Most of the country fewer people, wasn't back and fewer amenities. The state's population was small, and most people lived in major cities such as Anchorage, which is where McCunn lived. It, it, it did say that Alaska's population was small. I'm going to ask you guys a quick question in the comments. What state has the smallest population in the United States? Is it Alaska, Wyoming, or Vermont? You can choose um, which one. Let me comment, and I'll tell you the answer in a few seconds. Because it's not Alaska, it's actually Wyoming. Despite the challenges of living in Alaska, Many people were drawn to its wild beauty and opportunities for adventure. Hunters and fishermen came to test their skills against the state's abundant wildlife, while adventurers sought out the remote corners of the state to explore its rugged terrain. Alaska was a place where people could truly get away from it all and immerse themselves in nature, and this is exactly what McCunn wanted. McCunn survived by doing odd jobs, but his main that's, passion that's, was that's wildlife a, that's photography. It's a good, like, goal, do, thing to do. In 1976, Carl had lived remotely for five months in Brook Range, doing wildlife That's actually such a good career, This though. was a successful trip by all means. He considered himself as an experienced outdoorsman and enjoyed spending long times on his own connecting with nature and photographing animals. Five years after his first solo trip, he decided to do another. But looking back in hindsight, he was doomed from the very start. Why? In the month of March 1981, Carl McCunn chartered a bush pilot to transport him to a desolate, unnamed lake in an unnamed valley, well, situated roughly two miles I hope he told people he where he's going. <laughs> east of Fairbanks, Alaska. He had planned to stay for five months. McCunn believed that he had arranged for a pilot friend to pick him up in August. All right, so someone but did it know appeared it that he was. had not confirmed this plan with his friend. McCunn had enlisted the services of a bush pilot to fly him in, but he was relying on his friend to pick him up as he did not have enough money Something to pay for the return trip by the bush pilot. 
However, McCun never actually made these plans clear to his friend. In fact, oh, crap. his friend had little clue about his plans at all. That's the his worst thing to do. pilot friend also noted to McCun that he may be working in August and not to count on him to pick him up. Obviously, well, McCun put... didn't listen. That's, that's bad news. So with the intention of capturing the awe-inspiring natural landscapes of the Alaskan tundra, Carl McCun packed 500 rolls of film and an array of photography equipment for his camping trip. In addition, it's gorgeous. he brought along oh two guns God. and 1,400 pounds of provisions, mostly consisting of rice and beans to sustain him for the duration of his trip. He also kept a journal in which he would write in most days. In the initial entries of his journal, McCun expressed the yeah, observations like, of the seasonal like, migration of animals to their summer habitat. Like imagine just and remarked, doing like living here in the middle of nowhere. It's remarkable how humans are so disconnected with from their modern day environment in a place like this. He was fascinated with the That's birds, definitely true. especially loons, which is a rare species of bird predominantly found in Alaska. In the early days of his trip, Carl threw a good amount of his ammo it's into the lake. It's fantastic. He did this as he thought there. the amount he had brought was excessive. And this it is through like images, through words, a video. It's not like we're not even at it, and it looks incredible. Fast forward to August, McCorn had been living out there for five months. He had survived off his provisions, but they were now running low, and temperatures were starting to fall. But no problem, right? It was August. Carl was going to be picked up any day and return home. Except, this isn't what happened. By the time August arrived, Carl had begun to second-guess himself. An excerpt from his journal stated, I think I should have used more foresight about arranging my departure. I'll soon mm. find out. He was right to have these concerns. A few days into August passed, and nobody arrived to pick him up. Uh -oh. Carl waited and waited, That's not good. <laughs> but there was no sign of salvation. By mid-August, the seriousness of the situation was becoming apparent, and his anxiety grew. He wrote, Come on, please. Don't leave me hanging and fretting like this. I didn't come out here for that. Oh, Carl's food was now running dangerously good. low, so in order to preserve it, he began shooting ducks and game, and drying the meat off animals that had died in the lake. The weather was still warmish, but the rain was becoming a problem. Carl was still semi-hopeful that someone back home would send help. He had given a map of the area to his friends and father, but his father stated that Carl didn't exactly say where he would be in this area. He didn't say when he would return, and he told him That's that the if problem. he wasn't going back so by far August, remote. not to be worried, because he may have chosen to stay longer if the trip was going well. To get I, more I mean, I'm sorry, but this guy's this is, is terrible help. planning. If it, like you're going to go this far into in middle of nowhere, because he was back and late, you're saying his you don't have a clear plan, that, that's just going to go wrong. Carl was then found, and he asked his father not to do this again. Nevertheless, he wrote in his journal... Certainly someone in town should have figured something must be wrong. Me not being back by now. But then again, there's probably no one in town that gives a f What in the hell do those people think I gave them maps of my camp location for? Decoration? Little did McCun know, some of his friends were worried about him, and informed Alaska State Troopers to check on him in late August. Pilot David Hamilton flew out to McCun. As you can imagine, he was obviously very relieved when he saw the pilot. However, the pilot failed to detect any signs oh, of distress wait. exhibited by McCun, as the latter waved his orange bag in a nonchalant manner. Oh. Furthermore, during the pilot's third flyover of the campsite, he observed McCun walking back wait. to his tent in an equally relaxed manner. Consequently, the state trooper thought that McCun wasn't in any kind wait, of they, need of assistance. So they saw him? Around, when McCun saw the plane, he was thrilled and relieved. Oh my God. However, it wasn't till after the plane flew away he realized that he had made a grave mistake. In his diary, he wrote, I recall raising my right hand, shoulder high, and shaking my fist on the plane's second pass. It was a little cheer, like when your team scored a touchdown or something. Turns out, that's the signal for what? all okay, do not wait. Man, I can't believe it. It's certainly my fault that I'm here now. Man, oh I can't my believe God. it. I feel like a real klutz. Now I know why nobody... That's actually tragic. Boston. He went on to say, Unfortunately, the airplane was on wheels and couldn't land, so I stopped waving after its first pass. I then got busy packing things up and getting ready to break camp. The sunset approached. I began to doubt if the pilot took me seriously. McCun had blew his only chance of escape. Time went by, food became more scarce, 
and the weather was becoming colder. Now Carl oh, no. was not only fighting against the weather, but with the wild animals mm. fighting for food. As time progressed, the weather took a turn for the worse, and the lake gradually froze over due to the onset of snowfall. The situation worsened further as the availability of game dwindled, oh, prompting McCunn to set up water. stairs to catch really rabbits. Hard. However, his efforts were often no foiled fish. by wolves and foxes that frequently covered the traps. As November approached, McCunn found himself with no food, but what still baffles many to this day is the fact that McCunn was told by the bush pilot who dropped him off there was a hunting cabin five miles away from his campsite. Why Carl didn't decide to walk there when the weather got colder is still unknown. Carl did think about walking 75 miles to Fort Yukon, but at this point he was weak and the weather was too harsh. He had simply waited too long. He now had frostbite and wrote of having dizzy spells and delusions. In his journal he wrote, I'm frightened my end is near. This guy like messed up in every way possible. I've always got a bullet around. Terri but made terrible decisions. That. Besides, that may be the only sin I've never committed. This was a terrifying foreshadowing of his future. By December, he was barely hanging on. He had used the rest of his fuel and could no longer light a fire. In his diary, he wrote, If my body has been eaten on, or if it turns out I take my own life, just well, put me under a Well, he's been surviving for quite a so while. Isn't that August when he's been rescued? I don't want my family to see me that way. They'll be hurt enough as it is. Should I crazily attempt walking out in my condition <laughs> and I'm nowhere to be found, please carry out the above will. I kindly thank whoever may do so. The idea is me, Natch. He then went on to write his final excerpt, which read, I'm burning the last of my emergency Coleman light and just fed the fire the last of my split wood. When the ashes cool, I'll be cooling along with them. I chickened out once already, but I don't want to go through the chills again. They say it doesn't hurt. McCun then loaded his gun, and well, you know what happens next. Friends reported McCun missing on January Wait. the 19th, but due to harsh weather, authorities couldn't fly out until January the 26th. A state trooper found McCun's campsite during a flyover that day. Several troopers mm. arrived on February the 2nd, 1982, to inspect the tent. After opening it, they found McCunn's frozen body, along with his diary spanning 100 pages. McCunn's story serves as a cautionary tale of the dangers of underestimating the Alaskan wilderness and the importance of adequate preparation when venturing into remote areas. Oh my. His tragic end is a reminder that nature can be unforgiving and we Definitely. must respect its power and prepare ourselves accordingly. Speaking of nature being unforgiven, at the same time, if you're going to be going to the wilderness the way that far in the way he did, not having a clear path, um, and not being the smartest about the situations, like, I mean, if you're in a situation, I, you do the worst thing possible is by saying to a rescue helicopter that you're fine. I know he didn't intend to do it, but you should at least know what what that what, what the right thing. You don't celebrate. You don't act like you're celebrating. When a helicopter comes down near you, if you want to be rescued, that just, I don't, the, the choices he made were, were pretty poor in this situation. I'll, yeah, he didn't make a plan for how he's going to get out. He didn't make it very clear how he was going to get out. He didn't ask for help that much. And when he could have walked back to town when he was more healthy, uh, he decided uh, this, to stay where he was. Now, I don't know the complete situation he was in completely. Uh, but it sounds to me like this is just a bunch of poor decision making and unfortunate tragic events that led to his ultimate death. So with that being said, a lot of these stuff can happen um, in the wilderness and it, that's pretty tragic. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure to go and leave a like, subscribe to the channel, be reacting to more videos, uh, more on of this channel, more on other channels and all kinds of stuff. So let's make sure you go and subscribe and like and I'll see you guys in the next one.